What's up YouTube, Eric Vasquez here from Teach Me To Design, and today I've got a really fun tutorial for you because I'm going to be sharing five secrets to great poster designs. Now these are secrets and tips that I've developed in my own workflow anytime that I'm creating posters for clients in television or film or anything like that. So I'm gonna be showing you what things to keep in mind, what things to look for and to work on if you wanna achieve great results like this when creating posters from scratch in Adobe Photoshop. So let's jump right into it. All right, so let's get started here in Photoshop. I'm going to open up my free stock image that I downloaded from Unsplash, create a copy of it, and we're gonna jump right into tip number one, which is all about silhouettes. So we'll use the select and mask feature here in Photoshop. And once we do that, we get a pretty decent basic selection, but we wanna go ahead and use the refine brush tool here to go in and get some of those finer details around the hair. Now, the reason I say, you know, Silos is my number one tip here, my number one secret, is because it really sets apart and makes a difference between a professional looking poster and something that looks a little bit more amateurish or basic. Now, sure, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do silhouettes in Photoshop, but it's important to know what technique or what trick to use for what image, right? Depending on what you're working with. So anytime that I'm working with an image of a person or an animal, anything where there's like hair or fur, even like feathers involved, um, I'll use this technique because it really allows me to get in there and isolate all these little details. You know, the last thing that you want is to have helmet hair in your silhouette, right? Where you just have a hard edge going around somebody's entire head. You know, that's one of the fastest ways to make your design sort of uh, look a little bit cheaper and less professional. So what I'm doing here is just going in and really refining those edges, trying to get out all of those sort of yellow colors from the background of our original image and just trying to clean that up a little bit. Now, depending on, you know, the project, you may have images provided to you or you may have to go find your own. For this tutorial, we're just gonna be using free images that I'll drop links to in the description. But I'm just zooming in really far here and using my stylus on my Wacom tablet to kind of go all the way around the hair and just get all of those colors out or as much of it as I can. And the great thing about using this technique is that once you kind of go around and refine the edges, you can change the output from selection to a layer mask and that just gives you a lot more control uh, over the image. So you can still go back and make changes to it. All right. But then once I do that, I'm just going to rename the layer normal and you'll see why in just a second, I'm going to duplicate the layer, change the blending mode of it to maybe linear burn and drag it below the original layer. And what I like to do is put each of these into a folder. So I have one folder set to the normal blending mode, a second folder below, set to linear burn blending mode. And once I put these in folders, I can apply a layer mask to each one. And the reason why I do that is because, you know, I already have a layer mask applied to the individual layer, but I wanna continue to mask this and have even more control. So let's just go in and throw in a plain solid color background real quick. I'll use this light blue color and just put it into a folder called BG. And then inside of this Scylla layer where I have my normal and my linear burn layer, I'm going to use a round soft brush tool at a low opacity, maybe, you know, 175 pixels or 200 pixels. And just using a solid black soft round brush, I'm going to begin to brush around the edges of the normal folder. And that's going to reveal the linear burn folder below. Now, the reason that I do that is because it creates this sort of darker um, edges around the hair, which blend better with the image or with the background, I should say, right? And this just gives you a lot of control. So like I said, you know, having a few different tricks up your sleeve for doing silhouettes can really be uh, extremely useful anytime that you're doing poster designs because, you know, just using the magic wand every time might not work. You can use the pen tool, that might be great in certain situations, but not as great as this, right? Or even using something like the calculations method. All right, so now what I'm going to do that I, now that I have my uh, subject isolated, is apply an adjustment layer on top and I'll 
set it to have a bluish gray color. And then I'll change the blending mode to maybe, let's see, vivid light and reduce it to 50% or so. That looks pretty good. And you'll notice that I have a clipping mask applied to this as well. So it's only affecting the contents of that Silo folder. And then I'm going to apply a color lookup adjustment layer on top of that set to fall colors. Now I love using the color lookups. I think it's a great way to get some really interesting looks for your image. Um, and now what I'm doing is just starting to play around a little bit with different, you know, color combinations, different effects and things like that. All right. And then I'll go ahead and create a folder on top of that called CC. So we can do some quick basic color correction here. All right. So I'm going to drop a gradient map inside of this folder and then change these colors in here. So I'll change the first color maybe to something like this brick color, sort of like a brownish red. And then let's make the other color something with a little more contrast. So I'll go for like a bluish green color, something like that. Okay, and this doesn't have a clipping mask applied to it, so it's going to affect the background and the subject at the same time. All right, and that's looking kind of interesting so far, but I want to maybe play around with the levels a little bit. So I'm adding a levels adjustment layer with a clipping mask that is attached only to the gradient map. And now I'm going to play around with some of these settings a little bit just to tweak the contrast even further. Right. And by doing this, you just have so much control over it. So I love using adjustment layers with clipping masks. That should sort of be like, you know, secret 1.5 is using these clipping masks and adjustment layers because I use them so often. But really, you know, having that silhouette first is a great starting point. All right. And then maybe let's go in here and add a black and white adjustment layer between the gradient map and the levels. And that's going to sort of be like my base color correction layer. And starting to get some interesting looking results here. Almost a little bit like a like an Instagram filter, um, you know, or social media kind of filter that you'd put on a photo. So now let's make a copy of that subject folder. I'll put one above the color correction folder and then change the blending mode to luminosity. And then I'm going to drop the opacity down a bit. So I now have two copies of my subject, one below the color correction and one on top. Now, tip number two is going to be all about textures, right? I think a lot of times, you know, what I'll see, and if you're in a rush, what I will do sometimes is maybe just quickly throw a texture on top of everything and, you know, change the blending mode a bit, but we're going to do something a little bit different here, right? So I'm going to bring in this image from Unsplash, maybe rotate it, scale it up, flip it vertically, and then lower the opacity of it so I can just play around with the positioning and see where it's hitting my subject, you know, below this layer. Maybe somewhere around there looks pretty good. And then I can just bring the opacity back up once I'm happy with the placement. Right. But this is a cool looking image. I could leave the texture as is, but I want to try to do something a little bit more unique here. So I'm going to invert the texture, pressing command and I and then apply a levels adjustment layer on top of it with a clipping mask attached to it. And that way I have more control over the contrast and the levels here of the texture. So what I like to do when I'm working with textures is, you know, sometimes I'll use a texture in the background or on top, sure, but I also like to try to blend textures with my subjects with other parts of the image to try to get some more unique and interesting looking results. And I think, you know, once you have a texture that you're happy with, you can play around with, uh, you know, different blending modes and adding adjustment layers to it to try to get some really unique combinations. So I'm pretty happy with the way that that's looking. So I'm going to put that into a group folder. I'll just call it clouds top for now. Right. And then I want to try to find a way to make this, you know, feel a little bit more integrated into this design. So there's a couple of things that I think we could try here with this. Maybe I can do something where I use the selection of the, uh, the subject, the silhouette that we created in the beginning and maybe mask it so that you only see the clouds inside of the shape here. But 
I want to see if maybe I can do something a little bit different, you know, in this process, something that feels a little bit, uh, a little bit more unexpected. All right. So I'll make a copy of the clouds folder and merge it together. And then I'm just going to place it just above the top copy of my, uh, silo here, my subject top folder. And maybe I can use the white part of the clouds as a selection. Right, see if I can do something here with the layer mask. Yeah, I think what we can do here is use the magic wand tool to select just the white parts of the cloud and then use that as our selection. So I'm going to go ahead and try something out here. All right, I'll just turn that layer back on real quick. Try it again where I'm using the wand select similar, turn the texture off, grab the top copy of my subject, and then apply a layer mask to it. Hold command and click on the layer mask, go to the bottom copy and apply another layer mask there. So I've got the exact same layer mask on both copies of my subject. All right, and then I'll turn back the, the visibility. I'll turn the visibility on of that top clouds uh, folder there and maybe we can do something with the blending. So let's double click on the folder and I'm going to experiment with the blend if settings a little bit on the bottom here. So if you hold alt and option on the keyboard, you can pull apart these sliders and I'm just going to move that slider on the top all the way over to the right so that some of our original image starts to show through here. Right. And using these blend if options in conjunction with textures, uh, really starts to make things look pretty cool and pretty interesting. So I'm liking the way that this is starting to blend with the image here. So let me see what else I can do to try and make that even more interesting. I'll try and pull apart these other sliders and see that it's starting to kind of fade a little bit into the background color. Right. And that's not too bad. It's looking pretty good. So let's go ahead and click OK. And I'm liking the way that the clouds are kind of covering the, the face here and are, you know, in some parts over the body. So this is kind of an interesting way that you can use textures, um, you know, by experimenting with those blend if options and also using textures to create selections. So here I'll make another copy of the folder, merge it together, and I'll place it below the bottom copy of my subject. And then let's go ahead and change the blending mode to maybe something like difference or let's see. Yeah. Difference looks pretty cool because then it allows the original colors to come back. So it's a little bit less blue and there's a little less background showing through here. All right. So I now have two copies of my clouds, two copies of my subject, and I'll just get rid of that uh, merged copy that we don't really need anymore. All right, and that top copy too, I'm gonna to change the, I change the blending mode to luminosity and reduce the opacity a bit. So that's going to take us into tip three, which is selective sharpening and blurring. So if you press command option shift and E, it's going to merge all of the layers in your layer stack, convert it to a smart object, and then create a second copy of it, which you can invert, change the blend mode to vivid light, and then let's go ahead and blur it a little bit. So I'll go to the filters, Gaussian blur, Apply a blur of around nine pixels, put both copies into a group folder, and then change the blending mode of that folder to overlay. So this is a very similar effect to like a high pass, right? And it's a really cool effect. It's an interesting way to use this, but I don't want it to be like uniform across the whole image. So I'm going to reduce the opacity a little bit, and then I'll apply a layer mask and use a large soft round black brush to hide certain parts of the image that I don't want to be super sharp and detailed. And if you think about it, like the way that our eyes work, or even if you're looking at, you know, a photo or through a camera lens, not everything is always going to be equally sharp or equally blurry, right? So let's do the same thing. Make another copy here, convert it to a smart object, apply a Gaussian blur, and we can bump that up a little bit more, I think. Right. But then I'll also put a layer mask on this. So selective blur, selective sharpening, meaning that you have more control over where you want that to appear in your image. 
And I really like doing this. And I think it's another way to make your designs, your poster designs look more interesting because, you know, you're, it looks a little bit more random, right? It's sort of more organic, more random looking, as opposed to just a uniform sort of filter or effect that goes on top of everything, right? So being able to put these things into folders with layer masks on them gives you so much control over the image, right? So I'll put those into a group folder here. Again, just trying to keep things organized. I'll call it blur and sharpen. So let's go ahead and bring in another texture here. I'll bring in a grungy kind of grayish texture. I'm going to rotate it and scale it up a bit so that it covers our whole image. And then we can find another way to kind of blend this in and get some interesting looking results. Maybe we'll try color burn and bring the opacity down a bit to around 40% or then we can lower the fill a little bit too, just so it's, it's more subtle. All right, and then I'll go ahead and apply a curves adjustment layer with a clipping mask and just pull that middle point down a little bit to uh, get a little more contrast out of the texture here and see how it affects our image. Now, what I'm doing here uh, is really, uh, you know, tip four, which is global adjustments. And what I mean by that is I'm applying a series of adjustment layers uh, that are going to affect everything in the image. So unlike the blur and sharpen that we don't want to be you know, uniform across everything. These are some effects that I do want to affect everything in the image below these layers. So I'm putting on a color fill, a solid color fill adjustment layer set to exclusion, reducing the opacity. And then just like I was doing with my textures before, I'm going to try and experiment with the blend if sliders a little bit to get that to blend with our image a little bit more, just so some of those original colors beneath this layer can show through. Right, and it's just a more custom look. It's more customized. It feels a little bit more uh, sophisticated rather than just slapping something on at 100% opacity, right? Because you wanna gradually build up these more subtle tones and effects and layers. So now I'm gonna put an adjustment layer on top of that and change the hue and the saturation a bit. And then let's go ahead and put another color look up adjustment layer on top of the whole thing. And that gives it a nice kind of cool effect right there that I'm liking. I'm actually digging that. So let's go ahead and put all these into a group folder. And these are going to be our global adjustments. So doing these kind of adjustments, especially with more complex uh, photo composites, can be a great way to make everything feel more cohesive and uniform in your designs. All right, so you'll notice that as I bring these textures in, I'm going to file place embedded. And the reason that I like to do it this way is because it will automatically import your texture as a smart object, and it will already have the name of the file in the layer when you bring it in, right? So it kind of saves us, a, saves us a step there so we don't have to convert it to a smart object and manually type in a name, right? So I'll change the blending mode of this layer to exclusion. And that's looking pretty interesting already. And again, we'll use these blend if settings down here on the bottom of the layer style dialog box to see if we can get some more interesting and unique looking results here. All right, let's go ahead and throw a curves adjustment layer on here, put a clipping mask on it. So it's only affecting the texture, but even though the texture covers the entire image, it's going to still sort of affect the whole image. All right, and it's giving a pretty cool result. You can see little hints of the texture in the background but again, it looks totally different than the original texture. So I like to use textures in this way too, in combination with, um, you know, these adjustment layers and clipping masks. All right, so let's go ahead and just put that into a group folder called exclusion, and then maybe just bring the opacity down a little bit. We don't want it to be quite so intense. So like I said, it's about gradually building up more subtle effects and adjustment layers. All right, so that's kind of our global adjustments now that we have on top of everything. We've got our blur and sharpening, which we applied layer masks to. We have our textures blended in. We have a nice crisp silo. And that takes us to secret number five, which is typefaces, right? So a lot of times I'll see designers just pick one typeface and use it all over the place in a design. 
But what I like to do is try to find unique and interesting combinations. So here I'm using a font called Photograph Signature, and I'm just gonna increase the size a little bit, maybe make the kerning a little bit tighter. And then going in and manually adjusting the kerning or the, the tracking between the letters by holding the Alt Option key and using the left and right arrows gives it just that little touch that you need to make your type look professional. You don't want your type to feel like an afterthought. So these little touches like this can again make your designs look more professional. All right, and instead of a solid white, I'll sample a color that's already present in the design, like a little bit of an off-white color. And then we'll just position it somewhere down here on the bottom. So I always try to stay with maybe no more than three or four typefaces in a design. Obviously here we don't have a whole lot of copy that we need to worry about. So I'll probably just pick maybe two fonts here to work with. So I think usually if I have a script, I'll try to pair it with like a nice condensed typeface, maybe a sans serif. Acrobat Extra Bold looks pretty nice on this uh, in this instance. But I'm going to scale it down quite a bit, make it all caps. I don't know if it should be all caps. Let's try it out based on a true story. And then I'll change the color to maybe a red since that's a color that's already present in our design as well. And this can sort of be like our subhead or a subtitle down here below, um, below the main piece of copy that we have. Right, and then let's just position it down here below the title. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put these into a group folder just called copy or text so that everything is nice and organized. But tip number five, always give your type a custom touch and look for interesting combinations instead of using the same font across the board. All right, so these are five secrets to great poster designs. And I just wanted to share a little bit of uh, my workflow and my process with you guys uh, so that you can see how I work and some of the things that I'm always thinking about when I do work like this. So if you enjoyed this tutorial, take a look at the before and after. Please go ahead and smash that like button. Be sure to subscribe and click the notifications bell so you never miss a video every time new content drops. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Eric Vasquez here with Teach Me to Design, and we'll see you next time.